It's very interesting, as you can imagine, as, band, as our networks improve, uh, this is becoming a, a broader portion of what we're, what we're seeing, what we're doing on the Internet. Uh, and the kinds of uh, things that, the kinds of ways you can characterize distributed multimedia is one, there tends to be large quantities of distributed data, MP3s, um, movies, videos, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they're typically streamed out. So it's, it's uh, I mean, you can always download a file, but as the file sizes get bigger, um, it's probably not going to be something you want to do. Um, there can be one or more receivers of the data. Typically, that's the whole idea is that you have a lot of receivers, and they can be accessing this data at all at many points in time. Now, one of, the tr one of the difficult pieces here is that when you think about distributed multimedia is that you have to think about a general purpose infrastructure. So it's great if you've bought this, you know, this, this uh, transit, you know, transit on, on all these big uh, parts of the Internet because then you can have all that bandwidth and you can control it all yourself. But, but typically when we talk about distributed multimedia, we think about situations where you don't have control over a large part of that transit. You have to run it on, you have to imagine there's general purpose infrastructure, including the end user computers. Um, you can't make any guarantees about what those are going to look like. Uh, the data tends to be time sensitive, but not necessarily real time. So when people talk about, just want to make this distinction a bit clear, when people say real time, what they're typically talking about is something like a space shuttle or some kind of control system where if there's a piece of data that doesn't arrive within a certain time window, the results could be really bad. So, you know, in space shuttle, you don't want the thing blowing up or steering the wrong way. But if you miss a few frames or on your video or you miss a few words, you can always, that's not a, a disaster. Um, as, as losing um, frames becomes more of a disaster, that's when you might, for example, with a, a, call, a con call or a video call with the analysts, um, then you might actually want to go into not using the general purpose infrastructure, but using a more um, dedicated type of infrastructure. So there are four phases of of, of, for distributed multimedia, the first is encoding. And so that's taking whatever the type of media is, voice, video, um, in some cases uh, these days it can be scent or smell type, um, and turning that into some set of bits. Uh, the next one is storage, and that's not always required. Um, it can be required, for example, if your encoding uh, is a lot slower than what happens in real time. You might want to store it somewhere because otherwise you'll be streaming things and, and it'll come out quite choppy. Uh, transport, which is getting it from point A to potentially a lot of points, or many points to many points, and then the decoding. Um, the problem here is that you know you have all these four phases, and when you want to when you want to optimize, you have to you have to focus on what the bottlenecks are in the system, and depending on how you do these four phases, the bottlenecks are going to be different. One of the key bottlenecks that you'll find in distributed multimedia is the transport. And that's because these days, if you're thinking about distributed multimedia, um, you're probably thinking about sending it over the Internet. And as we saw before, the Internet doesn't make any guarantees around congestion or, or available bandwidth. It's a best efforts type of network. So what you want to do, and this is the, what you want to guarantee is a term called the quality of service. Uh, and as we know with the two generals problem, that you can't really have um, – you can't guarantee quality of service. You can't guarantee that the that packets are going to make it. You can't guarantee that you're going to have coordination or synchronization. But you can, there are ways that you can try to, to do your best and to get something pretty reasonable. So what are the different approaches? Well, some of these will seem quite familiar that you can use. Um, and we'll get into some of these later on. One is caching. You can do caching on the client side. You can do caching on the server side. Another one is priorities. If, you, um, if you've looked at the Internet 2 uh, spec, for example, they're really big on being able to prioritize packets specifically because of things like um, distributed multimedia. Um, so I would suggest if you're interested in this to take a look at that spec because there's already pieces of this thing built. There's uh, resource availability modeling. So this is, uh, think about, if you, if you think about your resource as your network, there's modeling how that network's going to react at certain times of the day under certain conditions and trying to, to base on, based on that, determine how you're going to try to provide quality of service for your multimedia. Now, one similarity here, um, when you think about quality of service, think about locking. 
I mean, in locking, the idea was you guarantee that a set of resources was going to be available. Similarly, when you think about quality of service and managing it, you want to make some kind of, of the best you can guarantees um, about what kinds of resources are going to be available for the distributed multimedia. And as usual, our asynchronous network is going to cause us to make trade-offs. If we had an isynchronous network, what, what, would we have a lot of these trade-offs in the transport? Isynchronous networks already guarantee the phone and so maybe definitely have that spot on that. That's right. So if you, oh, you go ahead. You compress just to get more, more people, more uh, information across. That's right. You might want to compress. And, and, but a lot of these issues are solved by isynchronous networks. That's why if you have, if you want to take it to the next level and you don't trust the internet and you're having some important kind of conference call, it's a lot more expensive. And the reason is because you use an isynchronous network and that guarantees you some, a lot of these uh, uh, quality of service type guarantees. So in transport, what are some of the issues we're worried about? Well, one is latency. So just review, who can tell me what latency is? Yes. Um, the time for any individual packet, so it's time sent to time received. Good. So it's time sent to time received. So the latency um, is, if you're using a satellite link, is going to be pretty high. If you're using, um, if you're on a local internet, a subnet uh, is probably going to be quite low. Bandwidth. What's bandwidth? Total amount transported per unit of time. The amount transported, so the capacity. What's the capacity of this particular pipe that you're sending it through? Now remember, the capacity of that pipe is dominated by what? What, what determines the capacity of the overall pipe? You can have a pipe this big at the beginning and this big at the end, but what's... The pardon? Wherever the bottleneck. The bottleneck, the weakest point. So just, cause, just because you have a cable modem connection that says one and a, it's, you know, maxes out at one and a half megabits per second and the server's on a hundred megabit per second line doesn't mean that you're going to get one megabit per second. Um, loss rate. Loss rate is the rate at which you lose data over this, over this transport mechanism. Um, and that's going to, if you lose um, voice, you're going to get a, you know, a little bit of voice. You might get a little bit of, of blank out time or some funny noise. If you lose too much, the, you know, the whole thing, the conversation just goes dead. Um, bursting. Bursting is what is the, the property of, of how your data looks like. So if you have your, your uh, based on, on uh, over time, over the internet, you can imagine there being a lot of messages all at once coming in, and the, then a burst of messages, and then there being some dead time, and then you can have another burst. This burstiness can sometimes be caused at the source. It can sometimes be caused along the way with a router, you know, filling, getting its buffer full and then doing processing and then all of a sudden shooting out a bunch of uh, packets. Um, but this is another, this is, this burstiness here, um, can, uh, can impact the quality of service, as can jitter. Jitter is, uh, what is a measure of the variability between packets. So imagine, um, that, that you needed that there was a, a server on this side sending a stream, client on this side. Imagine that the, the client needed, say these were one second, say the client needed a half second to process each of these packs. So, you know, it reads it in, processes it, and then it's, so it's, it's nice because you have a quarter second and a quarter second in between. But imagine that your jitter was, was more than a quarter second so that these could start you might have a stream where you have these two like this and then these two a little bit separate and so on. That jitter like that can negatively impact uh, your, the decoding on the other side. So it's one thing that, that people can be concerned about, especially for voice or video. Now, one of the big problems is that you have all of these quality of service concerns in a heterogeneous environment. So here, for example, I, took, I picked the number of half second. And it could be the case that if you're in a fast machine, the, that processing time is going to be a lot less. If you're on a slow machine, it's going to be greater. So distributed multimedia has a lot to do with end-to-end. -end. You have to be, you have to have some understanding of what the ends are in order to understand what's acceptable, what's the acceptable jitter, what's the acceptable bursting rate, what's the acceptable loss rate, etc. If we're thinking about um, how we're going to model this quality, how we're going to think about quality of service, uh, one thing you might start thinking about is what's what can you what do you have control over and what don't you have control over
Well, what's harder and more expensive to control are things like wide area networks. You can have congestion. We've talked about all those types of issues. The other thing that's harder to control are the protocols that are used. Right? If people are using a TCP IP type stack, right, you might have UDP on top of there but that, that can be that's ex that recognized by components along the way. But if you come up with your own brand new protocol, you're going to have to layer it on top of something that's already there, something that, that's exposed. So it, that might be a lot more expensive if you have to go and change the protocols that everybody's using. Typically, that's impractical. So instead, you try to control what's, what you do, what you can. And you can usually control things like what's going on in your local uh, area network. If you're a company, you can control over what's going on in the company, uh, parts of the company subnet. Um, you can do things like prioritize packets if you have control over your network. You can increase the buffer size on the different routers in your network. Um, you can also change the protocols used by the uh, ends of the connection. And if you're, on, if, you're, if you're doing something within a company, if you're doing something outside the company, so you have some server like a real audio or Windows media, and you have a client, you can also control what protocol is being used between them. So you can control that at a higher layer. So these are the areas that we can focus our attention on is where we have control and the ones that we don't, we just have to deal with that. So one of the ways that you can approach quality of service is to think about it in a, a reservation type of, of model. So you have a client And it wants, to, it wants to communicate to some server. And uh, the resources that connect these two together, imagine that they're controlled by a resource manager. And you can have lots of these different clients. You can have lots of these different servers. So the idea here is you go, that what the client does before it starts asking the server for to get streamed, it goes and asks the resource manager, I want to get a stream, I want to have a, uh, a communication channel with these properties. I want uh, 300 kilobits per second. I want um, less than um, one millisecond of latency, and so on. Now, what the resource manager does is it goes down, it checks its tables and says, what do I have available here? Do I have, um, how much bandwidth is available? Um, what, what kind of routing can I, can I do with the stuff that it can control? And the resource manager will come back to the client and say, you know, yes, you can have that, or no, you can't. Now, if the answer is yes, then, then that resource becomes available to the client and the server, and they, can, they have some token or some kind of a mechanism they can use to, to, to use uh, those resources that have been reserved for them. If the, client says, um, if the resource manager says no to the client, then what the client can do is say, well, okay, this, this would be a great way to, to have a video coming over here but that's this big and nice, but maybe I can try to scale that down some way scale down my request. Maybe, these, maybe I can get 150 kilobits per second and maybe less than 10 milliseconds of latency and so on. Won't be, if you're doing some kind of net meeting, it won't be as nice as this one, but it's still something that's doable. So what the client does in this case to try to get some kind of quality of service is it scales down to the point, at some point it's just, it's just going to say, well, I can't do this. And then it returns some kind of error or handles it. But it's going to start off asking for the most it can and scale down. Now, the idea here is that you want to maximally utilize these resources. And so the protocol that you're going to be using here are going to be things like the bandwidth latency, jitter, burstiness, anything that, that can be that the resource manager might be able to have some impact over. Have you guys heard of RS, the RSVP protocol on the, on the internet? OK, what, what have you heard about that? Okay, and the paper. So it's, it's a way, it's a, it's a protocol that's out there. There's a reference to it in the, in the text. And it's a protocol that's, be, that's used to do this kind of thing. So these, these protocols actually exist. There's, reser there's a way of reserving the resources. There's a spec around what you can and can't reserve and, and what that means. 
Now, one interesting thing here is if you're the client, there's nothing from stopping you. If, once you've got this, there's, there's no reason why you can't ask for more along the way. So let's say you ask for the 300, you get the 150. And what if, what if later on you know, more, more bandwidth becomes available, a better channel becomes available? Well, you'd like to use it. So along the way, as you're, as you're in the middle of this video or, or, or video conference, you can ask the resource manager, can I have some more resources? If the resource manager says yes, then you can upgrade the, the, the stream or to, uh, to the, uh, utilize those new resources. But the key is that the resource manager in this case can't all of a sudden, down, can't all of a sudden steal your, your resources and give them to someone else because otherwise that stream can get completely broken. Like yes? Intelligently scale down the servers to many or is it just, it's just a bad bad cut through? Like, go to stick figures. In the, <laughs> 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 uh, the scale down or scale up? Scale down, like when you're restricted. Like one of these teleconferences. Yeah, the, um, when that starts happening, then that means you're in real trouble. The, the idea here is that you're not supposed to, in this, in this type of mechanism, is you're not supposed to, once you guarantee that that resource is available, then that resource is supposed to be available for the duration of that, of that use. Um, so in a video conference, for example, when you're doing that, we'll, we'll see some other methods that you can use when all of a sudden you get into trouble here and you want to recover gracefully. Um, but the, the hard part there is once you start going down that slippery slope, it becomes, number one, it becomes harder for the client and, uh, to deal, or to be, it becomes harder for this communication, uh, for the client and server to communicate because they don't really know why this is happening, <laughs> right? They have this guarantee from this guy up here that they were going to get something, so they don't know, should I just go down one or should they go all the way to my minimum and then try to go back? I mean, it just becomes this game of not knowing, you know, why this, why this thing is happening. But we'll see some techniques at the end of how you can, actually deal with you know, that ha when, if and when that happens. Um, so one of, the ways that, one of the ways that you can use this um, is pe what people sometimes do is they'll go out and, and, and buy transit agreements. I don't know if you guys remember a transit agreement um, over, uh, if you buy transit with MCI, with Sprint, with all the major carriers, what happens is they guarantee you some amount of bandwidth. So they'll say, we'll give you a, uh, one and a half megabit per second on our trunk, and that's for you to use. You can do whatever you want with it. And if you want to do that, then what you can say is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overutilize that line in a, certain, in a certain type of way. So I can start saying, um, I, can, I, I, I can give, I can guarantee, you know, five different, uh, at the, at the, in the best case, I can do five of these, right? Because if it's a one and a half megabit per second, I can do five of these. But I'm going to go and sell my service to like, you know, 10 or 15 different people or more. And what I'm going to do is, if there's less than five of them at one time, I'm just going to give them the best that they can get. But I'm not going to guarantee them that they'll always be able to get this. I'm going to guarantee them that they can always get some rate down here, maybe 30 kilobits per second. And so if they go through my resource manager to try to allocate some of this, I'll give them whatever I can that's available at the time, but I'm not going to guarantee them that, the, that there's the best here. So that's how you get a bunch of clients. You fund this thing. Um, they're not all going to be using it at the same time, you hope, and you can use this reservation-type protocol to allocate resources on that dedicated line. If you don't have those type of transit agreements, then it's very hard to guarantee what the Internet is going to do for you. And I know some of your projects were around, you know, trying to, trying to, get around that issue that they get that the internet is all best efforts and there's you know that's an active area of research questions on this so what you don't want to happen is you don't want there to be resource hogging so you don't want it to be the case that they, you can game the system in other words so in the when one of the problems with this this model here is that if you're a client and let's say you're you rented some uh Let's say that you have um, some agreement with someone who's going to allow you to do transit. And you think, okay, well, at 10 o'clock this morning, I have an important conference call, so I'm going to try to reserve this, this, this uh, um, amount of, of, of uh, bandwidth and, and latency guarantees earlier on, just so that I can, you know, that I can use this and, I can, and, and then no one else can get it. That kind of thing can be unfair. Um, at a lower layer, think about... Um, Think about the, this client or the server over here, and imagine that it has a 10 megabit per second line. <laughs> 
and that one of these web servers is sending a bunch of like these these 300 kilobit per second streams and just trying to flood this flood this line, and these other ones are trying to send smaller ones. The question there arises: are, are you know who should get through? What kinds of guarantees should you be able to have? And if you don't have something like a resource manager that can manage all the way from end to end, one of the things you might try is um, is a different type of uh, approach to fairness. So if you're uh, at the server end and you're thinking about, well, I have all this all this data that wants to go out, you can use a round robin type approach. So if they're end clients, you can say, well, each of my end clients is going to get one end of this bandwidth when I'm streaming out. Uh, and so this is well, you know, this this makes a lot of sense because you're kind of you're, you're being fair with all of this. Um, and the problem is that this doesn't allow you have to worry about what granularity you're going to be doing this at. So imagine if that I get I say one end. Well, here's how you could game that. Say that you were doing this at the message at the message layer. So I said, well. Because it's messages, I, I let everybody send you know, 10 messages at every round robin stage and keep going like that. Well, one way I could game that is to make my messages really long and try to hog up that resource. Right, so that's probably not the best way. So you can start getting down to the granularity of you know, packets or at the, at the very lowest one, bits. And the uh, kinds of algorithms that you use to try to ensure that fairness are called fair queuing algorithms. There's quite a few. There's quite a bit of research that was done, especially um, in the late 80s, um, early 90s, around fair queuing. And the idea there is, uh, they, with those algorithm studies, the trade-off between how you utilize these resources. It's still an important notion of fairness of use between p different folks that are trying to use that resource. This is really important when you're thinking about distributed multimedia. I mean, it's important in general, but it's even more important when you're thinking about distributed multimedia because everybody has an incentive at that point to try to hog up the resource as much as they can. That, that's, that's the bottleneck in the system. There's a couple of references um, to, this, to this fair queuing. Um, the most interesting one in the book, if, if you want to go uh, hunt it down, is by is Demer, uh, Alan Demers, et cetera, from Xerox Park. Um, they did a really nice uh, fair queuing type of algorithm, and they had all these different measurements and statistics around why it was, um, what were the trade-offs that they made, and and how they achieved fairness. And what they found was that you actually had to get down to the lowest layer, which was the bit layer, like doing fair queuing on bits, in order to ensure that there was that there was fairness. The other thing they did to be practical is that they said you have to be, you can choose the time frame over which you're going to be fair. So if you say um, at times. You know, there at times one person may be able to hog the resource over somebody else, um, but over time you can prove um, that over time it'll be fair. This is another issue. At some at some points you may want someone to be able to hog it because they're just sending out a big video stream, but that's okay because later on when I need it I'll be able to hog it. So there's all these interesting issues of fairness and some kind of uh, you know a little bit of game theory around all of that. Um, but if you're if you're thinking about when you think about distributed multimedia, if you're thinking about these when you're writing these papers, think about this fairness issue and see if there's any place along the way that you can have resource hogging and how you deal with it. If you do this, uh, if you get these kind of allocations, does that then is there some system then that guarantees that your packets actually flow the way that you've gotten since you've had multiple paths? Yeah. If you're if this is something like a transit agreement, then the idea is that there is someone controlling that. Some router makes sure your packets actually get on the line. Right, right. So the, with, with the transit agreements, there's the, the routers for MCI and so on will recognize what's yours and what's not. Now, they don't give you a special line. It's not like they give they have a special one and a half megabit per second. They, it's this big trunk that just goes through, and their routers recognize you know the traffic and where it's coming and where it's going and whose it is. And if it's yours and you have that special token, then it gives yours priority over someone else's that's a general packet on the Internet, which it could drop. So that's, in essence, when you get these transit, as more people get transit agreements on this, then more packets will get naturally dropped that are not part of their transit agreement. How do you get your packet to MCI router? Um, you're connect, either connected to them directly, or if, they're, if you're not, then you can you, you buy a transit agreement with that, with your con the person connecting you to MCI, just to make sure that you get the full use of that. Yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's, um, 
So what, when you think about these systems, I mean, there's, there's, those are the two different kinds of, uh, of way. If you, oh, getting back to your question, the other kind, if you don't have a um, transit agreement and you're just doing it on the Internet, then you really don't, you just have the best efforts guarantee. So that's when you start getting into these probabilistic type of models where you try to figure out what's the best way to try to route this. Um, the thing that'll get you though in that is this hot potato routing that I talked about before that these, that these folks do. So if you're MCI and you have a packet that's, that's destined for somewhere else, like say a Sprint customer, here's the other guy up here and he's connected to you at uh, two different points. Suppose that, that this right here is the best path because these are big fat trunks, not very congested. Um, and that's for the, to get optimal uh, transmission, this would be great. And so this is, let me make this more clear. This is MCI. And this is Sprint. These are the kinds of issues you have to deal with with multimedia. What um, MCI is going to do is they're going to say, well, this thing's for Sprint. Once this guy gets it, he's just going to, they're just going to send it off to the Sprint network right there and let them deal with it. Even though there might be a more efficient route, like, now it gets worse if this here, is, you know, GTE, right, and then Sprint. They'll still do the same thing. doesn't matter. And the, they're incented to do that because they want to minimize the amount of traffic on their, on, their, uh, on their lines. So you can't, so this is one of, the, one of the reasons if you had transit on MCI and Sprint, then you'd get this, right? If you had transit on just MCI, then you'd get this. If this, was a, if this was a very fast link, but this was the bottleneck here, then um, if you had transit on GTE, then you could get this. So transit agreements are important if you're trying to create some real quality of service guarantees. If not, you're going to be subject to this hot potato routing, and that's why, you're gonna, that's why your streams can get congested all of a sudden when these things start getting rerouted. Now, the nice thing is if, you're, if everyone's on MCI, so this is another thing that I saw some folks doing. They were trying to sell this video system, and they were trying to encourage everyone to be on the same, uh, all on the same, uh, have the same ISP that they did. Because if you're all on MCI, then you're going to have to take it all over there anyway. So, you're, so then your goal is you want to maximize how fast you get it from one end of your network to the other. So these are the kinds of concerns if, you're, if you actually want to implement these types of systems and you're worried about, about types of quality of service. These are the kinds of internet type concerns that you have to get to the level of. Does that get to, does that, okay. If you own a lot of transit agreements, could you send a um, test message through, see who's fastest and route your packet? Yeah, well, if you have the transit agreements, you have a, you have much better, the, your model of what, what's available when is a, is very, is a lot more simplified, because you know your bandwidth is always gonna be available, you know, unless they violate the transit agreement. And then you can measure the latencies between the different hops, and so that, because you have, because they prefer, they give preference to your, these routers give preference to your packets, then those are gonna be more stable. Yes? If you're, uh, if the stream is big enough, though, and the bottleneck is large enough, wouldn't it be more efficient for MCI to route you through the big pipes anyway, as opposed to having this bottleneck slow, you know, and leaving you on their pipeline? Yeah, but they can drop your packets. <laughs> if they don't, I mean, if, if it comes down to it, they're just going to say, best efforts, drop. Right. I mean, there's no, they're not going to guarantee that at all. So if, and the, here's, from a business point of view, they're not going to want to do that because then they're eating up bandwidth that could be resold to someone else. So by minimizing the, the amount of time that anyone else's traffic is on their network, they increase the effective amount of, of, uh, of transit agreement type bandwidth they can sell. So yes. if I have a transit agreement, let me get this straight, with both MCI and GTI. GTE, uh-huh. GTE, whatever. Then um, MCI may still drop my hot potato packets and put them on that slow. If you have something with MCI, then they won't drop your packets unless they exceed the one and a half megabit, or the, unless they exceed the amount of bandwidth allocated <laughs> for your okay. agreement. So they, so if you pop more than that, then you're on the best efforts. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it turns out that if, uh, um, if you buy, there's about five or six major ISPs that if you buy transit from them, you're, you're covering a huge amount of the U.S. and, and, and parts of the world.
So what these, some of these um, companies that do this distributed multimedia, that one of the reasons they say they can give you good quality of service is because they have these transit agreements and they'll give you a list of cities or a list of places where they, where they can make those types of guarantees. Okay. So what are some of the ways? So let's, so here we found, we looked at quality of service, looked at transit agreements. We said, here's some way that you can get around some of these network issues, but you can't always get around them. Uh, so what are some of the ways that you can start trying to approach uh, making this, dealing with the fact that you have this uncertain network? Um, one of them is called traffic shaping. Um, now what traffic shaping is, is something that the server does to the traffic that's coming out, to these streams that's coming out, to make it more likely that you're going to get the right type of quality of service on the other end. Um, so the quest, things that you can do, it can control when data is sent, control how large these messages are, it can control um, uh, what type of message, whether it can pick, for example, video versus uh, voice, it can pick different types of streams, it can try to control the burstiness and jitter at the source. That doesn't mean that isn't, you're not going to get something happen to it along the way, but that's, the, that's one place where you, you can, if you're writing a service, you have a service, that you can start trying to mold this traffic so that it can get through. One is called um, the leaky bucket. And we have a great illustration of this in the book, actually, which is imagine that you have a bucket of water with some holes in it. And you have some, some uh, water being tossed in. And I'm going to use uh, one of these wheels. You know, you guys remember the, the water wheels that you see on the streams? It's just kind of tossing these sort of a bucket at a time. Well, what you're going to have is this water coming out at a certain, there's going to be a certain bandwidth, which is this going to be the size of the hole. And there's going to be uh, a certain rate at which this, you know, this, how, uh, uh, which this water comes out. So it kind of evens out the fact that in here you have these discrete buckets, you know, falling in. And out here you have this continuous stream coming out. So the anal analogous situation in, for a server is that what you do is, um, when the server has the data that it's sending out, it breaks it up into chunks, and then it sends those chunks out at a certain rate r out to the client. The other piece of this is that analogous to here is that you have a certain size of buffer. So that's the size of your bucket. So what you do is what the data gets put into this, to this buffer, and then the server will send out this data at a given rate to the client, try to eliminate jitter by sending it out at very, at the, as, as, a, as the best um, uh, synchronized way it can to some kind of whatever its clock is, uh, and you know, eliminate the burstiness by not allowing these things to get uh, piled up. So this is nice because now you have this nice, cool stream that's coming out, even though the data might be, uh, it might be receiving the data in a very different way. So an example of this is um, imagine that you were doing some kind of uh, real-time video or uh, audio compression. Uh, and you were saying, and you're, so there's compression, there was encoding. So this, the server that's, or the, the program that's doing this might be feeding the packets in at a, at a bursty rate or at some, at a rate that isn't regular. And what this leaky bucket algorithm is going to do is going to, is going to even that out so the client doesn't get all this burstiness and jitter, et cetera. So one of the, um, so this is nice. One of the issues that you may encounter with this is what happens if the, source here is feeding this data into this bucket in a way that um, that's very non-uniform. So imagine that it fed in a bunch of data and then let's say these four packets and then the four packets went out and then there was a long, there was a wait. Let's say maybe there was five second, five second wait and then all of a sudden it fed in another set of packets. Well, this thing's still going to be sending those packets out, you know, one at a time at this given rate. But what if you wanted it to be the case that if there was some kind of delay that as soon as you got the next set of packets, you would just send them out right away because the client might need them so that it can, you know, so that it doesn't get a buffer underflow or so that something, some, something bad doesn't happen. Well, what you can do then is a modification of this algorithm, which is, so this is the leaky bucket. And the other one is called the token bucket. <coughs> 
And it's a very similar idea. You still have um, some rate r that you prefer to send things out uh, at, or that limit, that, that's the limit of how, how overall you're going to be sending things out at. But it, here what you do is at every, um, at every, at this rate r, you're going to be generating tokens. And if there's a token available, if there's a message available, and there's a token available, then you can send that message out, and then you clear out that token. If there isn't a token available, then that message has to sit there and wait for a token to become available. That piece of it guarantees that your client is still, if there's, if there's, enough, uh, if there's enough messages in here, that your client's going to get something regular. But now what happens, suppose that... Um, there, wasn't a, there weren't a lot of messages that were accumulating, but there were a lot of tokens that were accumulating here instead. So there's some pause here, some hiccup or something on the, on the data side. Well, all of a sudden, these tokens start accumulating. Well, now all of a sudden, suppose you get three messages come in, boom, boom, boom. Because these tokens are available under this algorithm, the server's allowed to send them, ship them right out because there's tokens there. So what the tokens do, in essence, is they help... Um, they help regulate the rate at which things go out when there's a, when the buffer is getting full at a, a, a at some at a rate similar to that to the R. But what they also do is they ensure that the client, you know, if there hasn't been data coming in for a while, that it doesn't get too starved and that it gets you know another burst of data, uh, and uh, hopefully so that its buffer on the other side won't underflow. So these are two examples of how you can start shaping traffic on the server side to make it a bit more reasonable when it, and, and hopes that it gets a little more reasonable when it comes to the client side. If you, um, you can imagine, one, one thing that you can imagine doing is adding weights to these different messages. When you start doing that, um, it, you start getting into the realm of this fair queuing. So if you start adding weights, they correspond to priorities. So the minute you start thinking about priorities or modifying these to do so, anything of that manner, it benefits to start thinking about fair queuing theory because there's a lot of rich stuff on, on that side about what the right way is and what the implications are going to be of doing that. Well, let's think about quality of service from a very practical point of view. Um, if you're on an asynchronous network like the Internet, there's no 100% guarantee that you're going to get some, some quality of service. If you get transit agreements, it costs you money, but if you don't want to pay that money, then that's, that, you get what you get. So one of the things that you um, will want to do in a, in a practical system is to adapt. So what you, like we saw before, there was this reservation manager Resource manager on the internet, there is no resource manager if you're if you're just doing the best efforts. So your only alternative, is, as somebody suggested, is you have to adapt in in some way. Now the simple way is to just uh, build in so that you start dropping packets. So you know if your, if your buffers get full or if your clients, uh, if you're windowing over to your clients and and you get back some negative acknowledgments, you might just start decide well I'm going to start dropping things and and because by the time I send something back it might not be worth it or I might not have what I need to send back. A um, lot of reasons why dropping packets is not a good idea. What's better to do is think about this from a more end-to-end -end perspective. So what should I do when I start getting some congestion or when my latencies uh, starts becoming uh, a bit too long. And using a holistic approach is what's going to is what's going to maximize the quality of service between two different points. So let's use video as an example. Um, suppose that you were sending a video stream from a client to a server. I mean, I'm sorry, from a server to a client. And you start sending this over at some nice rate, 300 kilobits per second, and at a low latency, less than one millisecond. Everything's hunky-dory. You know, you got it's, it's progressing well, very nicely. Well, suppose now that there's some, some issues with congestion, or maybe there's a different route and the latency's going up, maybe jitter, burstiness whatever that might be, what do you do? Well, you don't want to just start, you don't want to just drop the stream. Um, you'd rather have it degrade gracefully. 
So one of the, so one of the things, um, one of the approaches that you can use is what's called scaling. And here's, um, there's five types of scaling that I've listed up here. And I'm going to go through each of them and show you why that actually, what, how that impacts the performance back and forth. So temporal, one thing that you could do is to just say, I'm going to start dropping every fifth frame that I send out. So what's that, what's that going to do to your bandwidth requirements? Decrease it by 20%. Decrease it by 20%. Boom. What's that going to do to the quality on the other side? Jerky. Little bit of jerkiness. But actually, the, the answer is going to depend on what type of algorithm you use to encode and decode. Right? Some of these algorithms have a little bit, can recover a little bit more gracefully than others. Um, so you, will, you might want to use that it, depending on, on what the impact is, what the quality is. So if you have some kind of graph that says quality and bandwidth based on the number of frame, drop frames. This is better to probably say quality based on drop frames. So if you, have, um, if you have zero drop frames, you can have a high quality. If your graph looks something like this, right, then you'll know that at some point here, this, this uh, dropping frames is going to be really bad for you. But as long as the amount of bandwidth that you have available allows, allows you to drop this many, the amount of frames that corresponds to this drop, uh, or sorry, this one here, then this, this should work fine. So this, is the, so this is how you start deciding what you want to do. Spatial. So spatial means that instead of having a nice big frame, you, you shrink it down and have a smaller one. Okay, now what happens? Well, same kind of thing. You lower your bandwidth requirements, but now you can have your frame rate is still, is still high, so you won't get this jerkiness. So again, you're going to have some kind of graph that, that corresponds to quality versus the size, and that, that'll tell you what type of bandwidth you're going to need for that and you can decide how you're going to scale down the size um, depending on that. Third one is, um, is frequency, which is, which is really around compression. Um, if you compress, so like you know, MPEG, these different types of formats are all around different forms, ways of compressing, and you guys, and JPEG too, you guys, had the quali- you guys know about the quality uh, setting and when you do a JPEG, right? You can say, I want more compression, but then as you have more compression, the quality goes down. So it's the same kind of graph where you have quality and then you have amount of compression. And you have some kind of, you know, you have, I don't know, they, you know, ideally you'd have something like this. I don't know exactly what that curve looks like for JPEGs. But at some point you're going to get past the, the point of diminishing returns where the thing just looks so awful that you just, it makes no sense to send it. Again, compress more. Um, this, uh, decreases, but what'll ha- what happens at this point when you start doing compression? What starts biting you as you do more compression? The server has to do more work. Server has to do more work. So at this point, now you start. You have to balance that with the amount of load on your CPU. Very important, especially if you have to decompress something before you can recompress it. So not all algorithms are very uh, accept uh, can accept this very easily. Another thing that you can do is um, what's called here amplitudal, which is to use a, a lower color depth on a per pixel basis. So what you can do is say, well, for every pixel that I'm sending over in the frame, instead of it being 32 bits, um, C, Y, M, K, I'm going to reduce it you know, sort of dynamically. I'm going to decide what I want each one to be, and I can start cutting out some of the bits, making them less significant. Uh, and that's so. I, and that's gonna it gives me a lot of control over how over over you know each frame and and how it looks. Um, but then again, what's what's the issue here again? If I want to do this reduction, and so ma- instead of 32 bits, I want to change it to say 16 bits. RGB. What's the issue here again? Even more, even even worse. Processor. Because if you have a stream in this format that's already encoded, then you have to decode it, recode it over here. You can try to do that ahead of time. Then you have a certain number of ones, but then your storage amount increases. 
So the, this type of, uh, is of, of, of uh, scaling is actually um, very difficult to do when you have uh, asymmetric algorithms where the encoding step, it takes a long time, but the decoding step is very fast. M the MPEG that you get on DVDs is that type of algorithm. And then there's also color map, which is let's just use less colors overall. Instead of having you know, millions of colors, let's just use 256 colors. <coughs> Uh, and so that's not on a per pixel basis. That's just let's change the whole thing to that. And so now everything's going to have an 8-bit. Uh, it's going to now that you the stream is going to be uh, colors an 8-bit. Uh, each pixel is going to be 8 bits, and it represents maps to some color in this color map. And that's going to give you a much tighter stream. But then again, if you have to do that on the fly, it might not be so pleasant on your CPU. And I'm still not sure how does the server and the client agree on this thing. So the way they can agree is that the client can send back packets saying help. <laughs> um, and what it, the, not, the best way, actually, is for the client to send back so, saying, um, if you actually sent me something of this form, scaled it this way, I could deal with it. And that, that's uh, the reason you want that to be the case is if this machine over here, I mean, is depending on how fast it is, Right, it might be, it might want different trade-offs here. It might be able to accept different sets of trade-offs here. So, and so on this side of it, you know, if someone starts, I mean, there can be things besides the network also that cause this to want to do that. So if you have a, if you're barely squeaking by and you have a Pentium 2 and you're just watching a video and you're, and then all of a sudden someone starts a, you know, Quake game or Netscape or something else, um, all of a sudden the client may not be able to handle the type of the quality of video that you're getting over. So that might not have anything to do with the network necessarily, but it's still something the client from an end-to-end -end perspective um, has to deal with. So it might send a message back saying, I want you to give me something that's, you know, if you can, give me something that's 256 colors because they just changed my, my color mode and I can optimize that very easily. But, but, but I guess you, you could easily imagine like client server has no kind of protocol. Yeah, I mean, there's, that's right, but a lot of the, like, if you, if you go into the real networks, I mean, some, a lot of these streaming will actually do this testing to test your connection between servers and clients. So there's, if you go into the real networks tab, you can find a little switch that says, like, you know, test my connection, and it goes through and it figures out, sends packets back and forth and tries to test out what this piece is here. It can't know ahead of time what you're going to be running at the same time that you're receiving a stream, but it can at least have some idea of, you know, this machine, the characteristics at this point in time were this, you know, like bandwidth, latency, that type of thing. So that typically you want some upfront type of work so that you can test out what these properties are. It's hard to do, um, it's hard to predict what these are going to be overall unless you have some more holistic, you know, probabilistic system over the, over the uh, greater part of the internet. Other questions? The last thing here is um, what's called filtering. And the idea is to use these different types of scaling, but to do it in a more um, fine-grained way. So instead of the server connecting to one client, it's typically going to connect, want to connect to several clients. Now, imagine that, and you can, you can, you know, make this, you can have um, intermediaries here if you want to also. Even if you don't have intermediaries, what I'm going to describe, you can still do at the, at the, on the server side. Um, imagine that, let me put one. These, by the way, these intermediaries it could be part of your infrastructure if you have these sitting around on the internet. Um, so you could it, you could implement this at, at uh, without having to have these nodes, um, without having to buy too many of these nodes. Um, and then let's put one more here. So the idea here is that imagine that these clients had all had different needs in terms of uh, in terms of what they could accept, um, but also had different performance characteristics on these links getting to them. What you could do is the server could send out the same high bandwidth or the highest quality type of stream to these guys here, and then let these guys here decide what they want to send further on down the line. So this one might say, I want the full thing. So it gets and get the, the whole thing. 
this one here might say I want something that's maybe uh, you know half, and it gets something a little bit less. This one here might say I want you know this one here might say I want something that's very low bandwidth. It gets something that's At this point, you can make that decision again. This one might say, I can take whatever this guy gives, and this one might be something that takes low. So here's a way that you can start, you can hierarchically uh, adjust how the, how much, what the uh, quality of service is going to be for quite a variety of clients. Now, one interesting thing about having these around is that remember some of, how some of these are going to require more CPU load, or you might need, require more storage. Now, all of a sudden, if you have these distributed, say, around the Internet, now you can distribute that type, of, that type of computation around instead of having it all happen at one big place that's loaded. So, again, as you get closer to the clients, you have more control over what's going on there. You have more predictability, more power to predict what the, what the, uh, uh, how these net pieces of the network are going to respond. So the closer you are, the, the better your decision-making power will, will, will be and the better that you'll be able to affect what happens at the client. Akamai, Akamai uses this strategy of, of having nodes all around the Internet, so all around at the edges, because that way they can control, you know, these, they basically send around GIFs or static type of images and deliver them. So it's not a multimedia, but their whole thing is they want to get it to you fast and furious. And by putting things closer to you, uh, along the internet, it allows them to predict with better uh, precision, you know, what they can do and what they can't do. Okay. I think real um, may separate audio and video streams because of you know the a constant audio stream can carry you through a few seconds of choppy video, and it doesn't involve the processor load. If you simply decide decide that when the bandwidth gets lower, you drop. Package video Yes. Good. So when you're doing some kind of synchronized multimedia, and there's one component that has that takes up many more resources, that's another type of scaling that you can use. Is to is to just drop the piece that's taking up most of the resources, so the rest of it can come through. And uh, the, the video conferencing does the same type of thing. It, hearing what's going on, seeing what's going on is important, but hearing it is critical. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll do that. And in fact, um, some of the time what they'll do is they'll, they'll prioritize synchronizing, trying to synchronize and try to be as real time with the audio as they can, even if the video is a little bit unsynchronized. Uh, and they'll do some of the, some of the scaling that we'll do with, to the video, but they'll want the audio to be saved. Now when you start getting into more interesting types of multimedia like the video, the sound, and then the smell, that you're talking about, um, then then you have to decide you know what's going to be important, and then it becomes more contextual. Other questions? Okay. What? Yes. Smell. They have these little. Um, they just launched. This company just launched. this read this article in PC Magazine about this little. You plug it into your. Uh, you plug it into your computer, and then it tra it has some chemicals that it can combine to create certain scents, and you know apple or. Orange, that type of thing. 